about the plummeting dollar and the skyrocketing renminbi and the ever-tightening belts of Americans whose orders for goods from South China were clobbering his business. Wei Dong had figured all this out because he paid attention and he saw things as they were. Because he talked to China, and China talked back to him. The fat and comfortable world he'd grown up in was not permanent, scratched in the sand, not carved in stone. His friends in China could see it better than anyone else could. Liu had worked as a security guard in a factory in Shilong New Town, a city that made appliances for sale in Britain. It had taken Wei Dong some time to understand this. The entire city, four million people, did nothing but make appliances for sale in Britain, a country with 80 million people. Then, one day, the factories on either side of Liu's had closed. They had all made goods for a few different companies, employing armies of young women to run the machines and assemble the pieces that came out of them. Young women always got the best jobs. Bosses liked them because they worked hard and didn't argue so much, at least. That's what everyone said. When Liu left his village in Sichuan province to come to South China, he'd talked to one of the girls who had come home from the factories for the mid-autumn festival, a girl who'd left a few years before and found wealth in Dongguan, who'd bought her parents a fine new two-story house with her money, who came home every year for the festival in fine clothes with a new mobile phone in a designer bag, looking like an alien or a model stepped fresh out of a magazine ad. If you go to a factory and it's not full of young girls. Don't take a job there, was her advice. Any place that can't attract a lot of young girls. There's something wrong with it. But the factory that Liu worked at, all the factories in Shilong New Town, were filled with young girls. The only jobs for men were as drivers, security guards, cleaners and cooks. The factories boomed, each one a small city itself, with its own kitchens, its own dormitories, its own infirmary and its own customs checkpoint where every vehicle and visitor going in or out of the wall got checked and inspected. And these indomitable cities had crumbled. The highest quality dishwasher company factory closed on Monday. The Boundless Energy Enterprises hot water heater plant went on Wednesday. Every day. Lou saw the bosses come in and out in their cars, waving them through after they'd flicked their IDs at him. One day, he steeled his nerve and leaned in the window, his face only inches from that of the man who paid his wages every month. We're doing better than the neighbors, eh? Boss, he tried for a jovial smile, the best he could muster, but he knew it wasn't very good. We do fine, the boss had barked. He had very smooth skin and a smart sport coat, but his shoulders were dusted with dandruff. And no one says otherwise. Just as you say, boss, Lou said, and leaned out of the window, trying to keep his smile in place. But he'd seen it in the boss's face, the factory would close. The next day, no bus came to the bus stop. Normally, there would have been 50 or 60 people waiting for the bus, mostly young men, the women mostly lived in the dorms. Security guards and janitors didn't rate dorm rooms. That morning, there were eight people waiting when he arrived at the bus stop. Ten minutes went by and a few more trickled to the stop, and still no bus came. Thirty minutes passed, Lou was now officially late for work, and still no bus came. He canvassed his fellow waiters to see if anyone was going near his factory and might want to share a taxi, an otherwise unthinkable luxury, but losing his job even was more unthinkable. One other guy, with a Shanxi accent, was willing, and that's when they noticed that there didn't seem to be any taxis cruising on the road either. So Lou, being Lou, walked to work, 15 kilometers in the scorching, melting, dripping heat, his security guard's shirt and coat over his arm, his undershirt rolled up to bare his belly, the dust caking up on his shoes. And when he arrived at the Miracle Spirit Condenser Dryer Factory and found himself in a mob of thousands of screeching young women in factory-issue smocks, crowded around the fence and the double padlocked rattling it and shouting at the factory's darkened doors. Many of the girls had small backpacks or duffel bags, overstuffed and leaking underwear and makeup on the ground. What's going on, he shouted at one, pulling her out of the mob. The bastards shut the factory and put us out. They did it at shift change. Pulled the fire alarm and screamed, fire, and, smoke, and when we were all out here, they ran out and padlocked the gate. Who, he'd always thought that if the factory were going to shut down, they'd use the security guards to do it. He'd always thought that he, at least, would get one last paycheck out of the company. The bosses, six of them. Mr. Dai and five of his supervisors. 
They locked the front gate and then they drove off through the back gate, locking it behind them. We're all locked out. All my things are in there. My phone, my money, my clothes. Dash quote dot. Her last paycheck. It was only three days to payday, and, of course, the company had kept their first eight weeks wages when they all started working. You had to ask your boss's permission if you wanted to change jobs and keep the money, otherwise you'd have to abandon two months' pay. Around Lou, the screams rose in pitch and small, feminine fists flailed at the air. Who were they shouting at? The factory was empty. The factory was empty. If they climbed the fence, cutting the barbed wire at the top, and then broke the locks on the factory doors. They'd have the run of the place. They couldn't carry out a condenser dryer, not easily, anyway, but there were plenty of small things, tools, chairs, things from the kitchen, the personal belongings of the girls who hadn't thought to bring them with when the fire alarm sounded. Lou knew about all the things that could be smuggled out of the factory. He was a security guard. Or had been. Part of his job had been to search the other employees when they left to make sure they weren't stealing. His supervisor, Mr. Chu, had searched him at the end of each shift, in turn. He wasn't sure who, if anyone, searched Mr. Chu. He had a small multi-tool that he clipped to his belt every morning. Having a set of pliers, a knife, and a screwdriver on you all the time changed the way you saw the world, it became a place to be cut, sliced, pried and unscrewed. Is that your only jacket, he shouted into the ear of the girl he'd been talking to. She was a little shorter than him, with a large mole on her cheek that he rather liked. Of course not, she said. I have three others inside. If I get you those three, can I use this one? He unfolded the pliers on his multi-tool. They were joined by a set of cogs that compounded the leverage of a squeezing palm, and the jaws of the plier were inset with a pair of wicked sharp wire cutters. The girl in his village had worked for a time in the SOG factory in Dongguan and she'd given him a pair and wished him good luck in South China. The girl with three more jackets looked up at the barbed wire. You'll be cut to ribbons, she said. He grinned. Maybe, he said. I think I can do it though. Boys, she hollered in his ear. He could smell her breakfast kanji on her breath, mixed with toothpaste. It made him homesick. All right. But be careful. She shrugged out of the jacket, revealing a set of densely muscled arms, worked to lean strength on the line. He wrapped it around his left hand, then wrapped his own coat around that, so that his hand looked like a cartoon boxing glove, trailing sleeves flapping down beneath it. It wasn't easy to climb the fence with one hand wrapped in a dozen thicknesses of fabric, but he'd always been a great climber, even in the village, a daring boy who'd gotten a reputation for climbing anything that stood still trees, houses, even factories. He had one good hand. Two feet, and one bandaged hand, and that was enough to get up the fifteen feet to the top. Once there, he gingerly wrapped his left hand around the razor wire, careful to pull straight down on it and not to saw from side to side. He had a vision of himself slipping and falling, the razor wire slicing his fingers from his hand so that they fell to the other side of the fence, wriggling like worms in the dust as he clutched his mangled hand and screamed, geysering blood over the girls around him. Well, you'd better not slip. Then, he thought grimly, carefully unfolding the multi-tool with his other hand, flipping it around like a butterfly knife, a move he'd often practiced, playing gunfighter in his room or when no one else was around at the gate. He gingerly slid it around the first coil of wire and squeezed down, watching the teeth on the gears mesh and strain at one another, turning the leverage of his right hand into hundreds of pounds of pressure bearing down right at the cutting edge of the pliers. They bit into the wire, caught, and then parted it. The coil of wire sprang free with a tooing sound, and he ducked away just in time to avoid having his nose, and maybe his ear and eye, sliced off by the wire but now he could transfer his left hand to the top of the fence, and put more weight on it, and reach for the second coil of wire with the cutters, hanging way out from the fence, as far as he could, to avoid the coil when it sprang free. Which it did, parting just as easily as the other coil had, and flying directly at him, and it was only by releasing his feet and dangling one-handed from the fence, slamming his body into it, that he avoided having his throat cut. As it was. The wire made a long scratch in the back of his scalp, which began to bleed freely down his back. He ignored it. Either it was shallow and would stop on its own, or it was deep and he'd need medical attention, but either way, he was going to clear the fence stop. 
All that remained now were three strands of barbed wire, and they were tougher to cut than the razor wire had been, but the barbs were widely spaced and the wire itself was less prone to crazy twanging whipsaws than the coiled razor wire. As each one parted, there was a roar of approval from the girls below him, and even though his scalp was stinging fiercely, he thought this might just be his finest hour, the first time in his life that he'd been something more than a security guard who'd left his backwards town to find insignificance in Guangdong province. And now he was able to unwind the jackets from around his hand and simply hop over the fence and clamber down the other side like a monkey, grinning all the way at the horde of young girls who were coming up the other side in a great wave. It wasn't long before the girl with three more jackets caught him up. He shook out her jacket, sliced through in four or five places, like a waiter offering a lady her coat, and she delicately slid those muscular arms into it and then she turned him around and poked at his scalp. Shallow, she said. It'll bleed a lot, but you'll be okay, she planted a sisterly kiss on his cheek. You're a good boy, she said, and then ran off to join the stream of girls who were entering the factory through a smashed door. Shortly, he found himself alone in the factory yard, amid the neat gravel pathways and the trimmed lawns. He let himself into the factory but he couldn't actually bring himself to take anything, though they owed him nearly three months' wages. Somehow, it seemed to him that the girls who'd used the tools should have their pick of the tools, that the men who'd cooked the meals should have their pick of the things from the kitchens. Finally, he settled on one of the communal bicycles that were neatly parked near the factory gates. These were used by all the employees equally, and besides, he needed to get home and walking back with a scalp wound in the midday heat didn't sound like much of a plan. On the way home, the world seemed much changed. He'd become a criminal, for one thing, which seemed to him to be quite a distance from a security guard. But it was more than that, the air seemed clearer, later, he read that the air was clearer, thanks to all the factories that had shut down and the buses that had stayed parked. Most of the shops seemed closed and the remainder were tended by listless storekeepers who sat on their stoops or played mahjong on them, though it was the middle of the day. All the restaurants and cafes were shut. At a train crossing, he watched an intercity train shoot past, every car jammed with young women and their bags, leaving Shilong New Town to find their way somewhere else where there was still work. Just like that, in the space of just a week or two. This giant city had died. It had all seemed so incredibly powerful when he'd arrived, new paved roads and new stores and new buildings, and the factories soaring against the sky wherever you looked. By the time he reached home, dizzy from the aching cut on his scalp, sweaty, hungry, he knew that the magical city was just a pile of concrete and a mountain of workers' sweat, and that it had all the permanence of a dream. Somewhere, in a distant land he barely knew the name of, people had stopped buying washing machines, and so his city had died. He thought he'd lie down for just the briefest of naps, but by the time he got up and gathered a few things into a duffel bag and got back on his bike. Not bothering to lock the door of his apartment behind him, the train station was barricaded, and there was a long line of refugees slogging down the road to Shenzhen, two days walk away at least. He was glad he'd taken the bicycle then. Later, he found a working ATM and drew out some cash, which was more reassuring than he'd anticipated. For a while there, it had seemed like the world had come to an end. It was a relief to find out that it was just his little corner. In Shenzhen, he'd started hanging out in internet cafes, because they were the cheapest places to sit indoors, out of the heat, and because they were filled with young men like him, scraping by. And because he could talk to his parents from there, telling them made-up stories about his non-existent job search, promising that he'd start sending money home soon. And that was where the guild found him. Ping and his friends, and they had this buddy on the other side of the planet, this Wei Dong character who'd hung wrapped on every turn of his tail. Who'd told him that he'd written it up for a social studies report at school, which made them all laugh. And he'd found happiness and work, and he'd found a truth, too. The world wasn't built on rock, but rather on sand, and it would shift forever. Wei Dong didn't know how much longer his father's business would last. Maybe 30 years, but he thought it would be a lot less than that. Every day, he woke in his bedroom under his Spongebob sheets and thought about which of these things he could live without, just how basic his life could get. And here it was, the chance to find out. When his great-grandparents had been his age. They'd been war refugees, crossing the ocean on a crowded boat. 
traveling on stolen papers, an infant in his great-grandmother's arms and another in her belly. If they could do it. Wei Dong could do it. He'd need a place to stay, which meant money, which meant a job. The guild would cut him in for his share of the money from the raids, but that wasn't enough to survive in America. Or was it? He wondered how much the Guatemalans around him earned at their illegal dishwashing and cleaning and gardening jobs. In any event, he wouldn't have to find out, because he had something they didn't have, a social security number. And yes, that meant that eventually his parents would be able to find him, but in another month. He'd be 18 and it'd be too late for them to do anything about it if he didn't want to cooperate. In those hours where he'd planned for the demise of his family's fortune. He'd settled quickly on the easiest job he could step into. Mechanical Turk. The Turks were an army of workers in game space. All you had to do was prove that you were a decent player, the game had the stats to know it, and sign up, and then log in whenever you wanted a shift. The game would ping you any time a player did something the game didn't know how to interpret, talked too intensely to a non-player character, stuck a sword where it didn't belong, climbed a tree that no one had bothered to add any details to, and you'd have to play spot referee. You'd play the non-player character, choose a behavior for the stabbed object, or make a decision from a menu of possible things you might find in a tree. It didn't pay much, but it didn't take much time, either. Wei Dong had calculated that if he played two computers, something he was sure he could keep up, and did a new job every 20 seconds on each, he could make as much as the senior managers at his father's company. He'd have to do it for 10 hours a day, but he'd spent plenty of weekends playing for 12 or even 14 hours a day, so hell, it was practically money in the bank. So he used the rented PC to sign onto his account and started filling in the paperwork to apply for the job. All the while, he was conscious of his rarely used email account and of the messages from his parents that surely awaited him. The forms were long and boring, but easy enough, even the little essay questions where you had to answer a bunch of hypothetical questions about what you'd do if a player did this or said that. And that email from his parents was lurking, demanding that he download it and read it. He flipped to a browser and brought up his email. It had been weeks since he'd last checked it and it was choked with hundreds of spams, but there, at the top. Rachel Rosenbaum, where are you? Of course his mother was the one to send the email. It was always her on email, sending him little encouraging notes through the school day, reminding him of his grandparents' and cousins' and father's birthdays. His father used email when he had to, usually at two in the morning when he couldn't sleep for worry about work and he needed to ball out his managers without waking them up on the phone. But if the phone was an option, dad would take it. Where are you? The subject line said it all. Didn't it? Leonard, this is crazy. If you want to be treated like an adult, start acting like one. Don't sneak around behind our backs, playing games in the middle of the night. Don't run off to God knows where to sulk. We can negotiate this like family, like grown-ups, but first you'll have to come home and stop behaving like a spoiled brat. We love you, Leonard, and we're worried about you, and we want to help you. I know when you're 17 it's easy to feel like you have all the answers, he stopped reading and blew hot air out his nostrils. He hated it when adults told him he only felt the way he did because he was young. As if being young was like being insane or drunk, like the convictions he held were hallucinations caused by a mental illness that could only be cured by waiting five years. Why not just stick him in a box and lock it until he turned 22? He began to hit reply, then realized that he was logged in without going through an anonymizer. His guildies were big into these, they were servers that relayed your traffic, obscuring your identity and the addresses you were trying to avoid. The best ones came from Falun Gong, the weird religious cult that the Chinese government was bent on stamping out. Falun Gong put new relays online every hour or so, staying a hop ahead of the Great Firewall of China, the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-controlling server farm that was supposed to keep 1.6 billion Chinese people from looking at the wrong kind of information. No one in the guild had much time for Falun Gong or its quirky beliefs, but everyone agreed that they ran a tight ship when it came to punching holes in the Great Firewall. A quick troll through the ever-rotating index pages for Falun Gong relays found Wei Dong a machine that would take his traffic. Then he replied to his mom. Let her try to run his backtrail, it would dead end with a notorious Chinese religious cult. That'd give her something to worry about all right. 
Mom, I'm fine. I'm acting like an adult, taking care of myself, making my own decisions. It might have been wrong to lie to you guys about what I was doing with my time, but kidnapping your son to military school is about as non-adult as you can get. I'll be in touch when I get a chance. I love you too. Don't worry. I'm safe. Was he, really, as safe as his great-grandparents had been, stepping off the ship in New York? As safe as Lou had been, bicycling the cracked road to Shenzhen. He'd find a place to stay, he could Google, cheap hotel downtown Los Angeles, as well as the next kid. He had money. He had a SSN. He had a job, two jobs, counting the guild work, and he had plenty of practice missions he'd have to run before he'd start earning. And it was time to get down to it. Hash. Part 2. Hard work at play. This scene is dedicated to the incomparable mysterious galaxy in San Diego, California. The mysterious galaxy folks have had me in to sign books every time I've been in San Diego for a conference or to teach. The Clarion Writers Workshop is based at UC San Diego in nearby La Jolla, CA, and every time I show up, they pack the house. This is a store with a loyal following of die-hard fans who know that they'll always be able to get great recommendations and great ideas at the store. In summer 2007, I took my writing class from Clarion down to the store for the midnight launch of the final Harry Potter book and I've never seen such a rollicking, awesomely fun party at a store. Mysterious Galaxy. 7051 Claremont Mesa Boulevard. Suite number 302 San Diego. CA USA 92111 plus 1 858 268 4747. They came for the workers in the game and in the real world, a coordinated assault that left Big Sister Noor's organization in tatters. On that fateful night, she'd taken up the back room of Headshot, a PC bong in the Galing District in Singapore, a neighborhood that throbbed all night long from the roaring sex trade from the legal brothels and the illegal street hookers. Any time after dark, the Galing streets were choked with people, from adventurous diners eating in the excellent all-night restaurants almost all of them halal, which always made her smile, to guest workers and Singaporeans on the prowl for illicit thrills to the girls dashing out on their breaks to the all-night supermarkets to do their shopping. The Galing was as unbuttoned as Singapore got, one of the few places where you could be out of bounds, doing something that was illegal, immoral, unmentionable, or bad for social harmony, without attracting too much attention. Headshot strobbed all night long with networked poker games, big shoot em up tournaments, guest workers phoning home on the cheap, shouting over the noise salad of all those games, and, on that night, Big Sister Noor and her clan. They called themselves the Webleys, which was an obscure little joke that pleased Big Sister nor an awful lot. Nearly a century ago, a group of workers had formed a union called the Industrial Workers of the World, the first union that said that all workers needed to stick up for each other, that every worker was welcome no matter the color of his skin, no matter if the worker was a woman, no matter if the worker did skilled or unskilled work. They called themselves the Wobblies. Information about the Wobblies was just one of the many out-of-bounds subjects that were blocked on the Singaporean internet, and so of course Big Sister Nor had made it her business to find out more about them. The more she read, the more sense this group from out of history made for the world of right now, everything that the IWW had done needed doing today, and what's more, it would be easier today than it had been. Take organizing workers. Back then. You'd have to actually get into the factory or at least stand at its gates to talk to workers about signing a union card and demanding better conditions, higher wages and shorter hours. Now you could reach those same people online, from anywhere in the world. Once they were members, they could talk to all the other members, using the same tools. She'd decided to call her little group the Industrial Workers of the World Wide Web, the IWWWW. And that was another of those jokes that pleased her an awful lot. And the IWWWW had grown and grown and grown. Gold farmers were easy pickings, working in terrible conditions all over the world, for terrible wages, hated by the game runners and the rich players alike. They already understood about working in teams. They'd already formed their own little guilds, and they were better at using the internet than their bosses would ever be. 
Now, a year later, the IWWWW had over 20.000 members signed up in six countries, paying dues and filling up a fat strike fund that had finally been called into use, in Shenzhen, the last place Big Sister nor had ever expected to see a walkout. But they had, they had. The boss, some character named Wing, had declared a lock-in at three of his factories, internet cafes that he'd taken over to support his burgeoning army of workers, in order to take advantage of a sploit in Mushroom Kingdom, a Mario-based MMO that had a huge following in Brazil. One of his workers had found a way to triple the gold they took out of one of the dungeons, and he wanted to extract every penny he could before Nintendo Sun caught on to it. The next thing she knew, her phone was rattling with urgent messages relayed from her various in-game identities to tell her that the workers had knocked aside the factory management and guards and stormed out, climbing the sides of the buildings or the utility poles and cutting the cafe's network links. They'd formed up out front and begun to chant impromptu slogans, mostly adapted from their in-game battle cries. And now they wanted to know what to do. It's a wildcat strike, Big Sister Noor said to her lieutenants. The mighty Krang and Just Bob, the former a small Chinese guy with frosted purple tips in his hair, the latter a Tamil girl in a beautiful, immaculate sari and silk slippers, a girl who had previously run with one of the most notorious girl gangs in Asia and spent three years in prison for her trouble. They've walked out in Shenzhen, she forwarded the tweets and blips and alerts off her phone, then showed them her screen while they waited for the forwards to land on their devices. It's crazy. The mighty Krang said. Dancing from foot to foot, excitedly. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's wonderful, just Bob said. Planting her palms on his shoulders and bringing him back to the earth. An overdue. I predicted this. I predicted it from the start. As soon as you start collecting dues for a strike fund, someone's going to go on strike. And Lala, here we are, wildcatting the night away. The next step was to head for headquarters, the back room at Headshot, to slam themselves into their chairs and to hit the worlds, spreading the word to all 20.000 members about the first ever strike. Big Sister Noor went to work on a plan. 1. Spread the word to the rank and file. 2. Recruit in world pickets to block the worksite so that Boss Wing couldn't bring in scabs, replacement workers, to get the job done. 3. Get the strike leaders on the phone and talk about human rights lawyers. Strike pay, sleeping quarters for any workers who relied on the factory for dorm beds, for Get footage and real-time reports from the strikers out to the human rights wires, get the strike leaders on interviews with the press. She'd done this before, in real life, on the other side of things, as a wildcat strike leader walking off the line when the bosses at her weaving factory in Taman McMurr announced pay cuts because their big European distributor had cut its orders. It happened every year, but it made her so angry, the workers didn't get bonuses, sharing in the good fortune when distributors increased their orders, but they were made to share the burden when orders went down. Well, forget it, enough was enough. She'd stood up in the middle of the factory floor and denounced the bosses for the greedy, immoral bastards they were, and when the security moved in to take her. She'd stood proud and strong, ready to be beaten for her insolence. Instead, her fellow workers had risen to her defense, the young women around her getting to their feet and surrounding her, cheering her, ululating cries shouting around waggling tongues that bounced off the ceiling and filled the room and her heart, making them all brave, so that the security men moved back, and they'd taken over the factory, blocking the gates, shutting it down, and then someone from the Malaysian Union of Textile Employees had been there to get them to sign cards, and someone had made her picket captain and then, and then it had all come crashing down around them, police police vans moving in, the police forming a line and ordering them to disperse, to get back to work, to stop this foolishness before someone got hurt, barking the orders through a bullhorn, glaring at them from beneath their riot helmets, banging their truncheons on their shields, spraying them with tear gas. Their line wavered. 